Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hey there, it's George the Antique Nomad. I'm in Puyallup, unexpectedly, and I'm at the Puyallup uh, Fairplex show, and this happens twice a year, and sometimes I get to show at it, but today I just get to be a customer. We're going to go in for early buying and see what we can find while people are still setting up. So we paid extra to be early buyers today, and the reason is that I usually do this show, but I can't this time because I have to be back in Florida. This just sort of came up unexpectedly this trip so we get to shop instead. There is a really beautiful Weller piece with the flower frog and the encrusted flowers. I've had that before and the pattern name is Silvertone. It's really nice artware. That set's 215. I think I sold mine for a little more than that so that seems like a good price to me. And then Super Deluxe Convertible Club Coupe. These would have been cardboard to put on out at the uh, dealership so they weren't really meant to last. So that's actually a pretty neat thing to see now. Let's see what else we have here. You can see this is a big haul. There's usually several hundred dealers here and it seems like there are this time as well. See you in a minute. Civil War era cookware. Well, they've cleaned up and seasoned a lot of this, but you can tell these are older pieces. Look at the way the number 11 is cast on this. It's a little rougher. The general finish is a little rougher. Foundry methods were not as good in the 1800s as they were later, and so you will see a little bit more of a crudeness to the cast iron from that era. This guy has an entire wall, in fact an entire booth full of old posters and displays for various really crazy things from advertising to Dracula and the House of Crazies. That looks like fun. The alligator. The alligator will make your skin crawl. Love that crap. Here's a fun booth that's a little more bohemian chic with a lot of uh, vintage fashion, umbrellas, fun art. This is a way of display that's very popular with some folks where you really layer it in and it just makes everything really rich and deep and buried like a museum. Except you get to have it at home. I like the phone. I always like phones. I think I'll get this phone. This dealer has a whole lot of blue transfer wear, including Flow Blue. And someone asked me recently in one of my other videos what the difference was. So let me try to show you here. So transfer wear is where you use a transfer decal and you put it under the glaze and that makes the pattern. It was invented in the late 1700s so that they wouldn't have to pay people to paint El China by hand. However, when they first started doing it, Sometimes the decals didn't really set well, and when you put the glaze on and fired it, it would actually run a bit. See how the detail in this, the blue has flowed into the white? That's why it's called flow blue. Now, the English were the ones who made most of these ceramics back in the late 1700s and early 1800s, and they considered the flow blue to be a factory second. So what they did is they put all of those in barrels and sent them to the United States of America, actually the colonies at the time, and then later the USA, and they sold all of the flow blue pieces to us because they considered them to be inferior, but Americans ended up having a real taste for it. So here's a good example. Here's one where it isn't flowing. These pieces here are all flow because again the blue has bled into the white. Here's a really good example. This one is a particular pattern from the early 1800s in England. You can see it has a very high price. Now in England they are not interested in these pieces to this day. They still consider them inferior. We on the other hand find them very collectible. So this is our friend Andrea's space, and Andrea loves Art Deco and she loves Space White, and boy, I, can you not see why? I mean, these are just beautiful pieces. There's really deep hard bangles. She's got the multicolored striped ones. She's got a really incredible display, and the thing is, she's very, very 
serious about only selling old pieces, so everything in here is genuinely vintage. And she's got uh, carved horse heads and crabs and the hand holding the cherries and a lot of real classic ones that you see in all the old books about Bakelite, so very collectible and just one of the best displays you'll see on the West Coast. I wanted to show you a table of this glass. These are pieces by Charles Lawton. L-O-T-T-O-N, and his son David and his other son are also involved. They make beautiful pieces. Charles is in his 80s and doesn't produce a lot anymore, so his pieces are in the realm of vintage collectible now. But it's just amazing work. It's cased glass where they have these layers of design and then the flora and fauna inside just seem to be suspended in space. And they are becoming quite collectible and there's an entire book about it that you can read called Lawton Art Glass that will explain all about their technique. Here's a space for you. Nothing but antique prints. All sorts of really great things. This one's a yard long. This is Paul de Longpre and we see a lot of floral from about 1900. From him this one's The Study of Roses. The chromolithography was done in New York Here's one that is from Frank Leslie's, a Lewis Wayne piece. Lewis Wayne was known for his cat illustration. And these are Pussy Enjoys the First Blizzard of the Year. And it looks like they're having, well, sort of fun. They actually look like cats might react to snow, not entirely delighted. There's advertising with the lovely woman on the horse. You've got skiers. This one advertises the calendar company. Here's a fun one. This is Dr. A.C. Daniel's Famous Dog Remedies, and it has the various Coolidge pieces for the dogs playing poker. You have this one where they're playing. You have this one where the one is trying to pass the card to the other one under the table. See that? Naughty dog. You have this one where the ladies are coming in and breaking up the poker game. And then you have this one where things aren't going well and they're not getting along too well. These two are actually a pair. This is scene one and this is scene, scene one and two. Oh, okay, yes. thank you. I appreciate that. By the same artist. It's funny because I'm aware of Coolidge, but I haven't actually seen all four framed up together like this before. Well, this is really Denver. unusual. <laughs> Dr. Daniel's famous dog remedy. Yeah, that's these are all beer pull taps. And actually they have some cider and wine ones as well. And they run the gamut anywhere from about 10 to 45 or $50, depending on rarity. Uh, a lot of these were done, the smaller ones are actually older. These big long poles are things that we see more recently. Originally they were little and usually metal and enamel, like the Blatt's old Heidelberg you see in the middle there. And these are very collectible. And this fellow I'm gonna pull out here has a whole table full of these. He's uh, here from uh, New England doing shows. So if you'd like to see more categories of antique and vintage from the Puyallup Antique Expo, join me on Periscope. Periscope is a live stream app on your phone where you can just watch it on your computer. And I do Periscopes on occasion. I probably have five dozen videos so you can see me doing a lot of things besides what I do here on YouTube. You can find the link in the description. Well, wow, this is a very busy show, and so we're going to show you what we can. we got to try to stay out of people's ways, but we definitely want to show you some cool stuff. The 49 Dodge pickup sign is kind of a neat thing. And here's some signs off of old American locomotive and other uh, railroad equipment companies. These are really popular with railroad collectors now. Got the old Matchbox super fast. If you can find the early Matchbox stuff, it really does sell for a lot these days. Uh, boy, this dealer has got the toys. Look at this. I mean, these are all real and these are all old. You've got the motorcycle. That's a hard piece to find from the 1930s. Looks like he's about to crash down on a 1920s Franklin and a Chrysler Airflow. The Chrysler Airflow actually has lights, real lights, that light up. So this must have been a friction drive that made the lights go. That's an unusual piece for certain. There's an old 1920 Chevy on the left. He's just got an ocean of these. 
it's amazing to see so many in one place. Very few people, collectors even, have this level of collection, let alone dealers. Really unusual piece here. This one's for advertising the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. That's what race cars look like really up until about 1960. Here are a whole lot of mechanical banks, really good mechanical banks. You put the coin in the guy's hand and he swallows it. You put the coin in the owl's head and the head turns. You put the coin on the gun that the Indian is shooting at the bear and it shoots it into the bear's stomach and that's where the coins go. Uncle Sam drops one into his carpet bag. Very desirable, very hard to find originals. There's a lot of reproductions that are not well made. These are all original from the 1890s and prices are going to be anywhere from about $250 to $1,000 depending on. They've had a good antique district here in Puyallup for many years, even before the show started. Part of the reason the show came here is because they had a good group of antique dealers here. So if you ever get to Puyallup to the show, it is a really fun place to antique. You can spend all day and all weekend. So I'm having a lot of fun at Puyallup. I actually bought a bunch of things. I probably spent two or three hundred dollars in fact. So uh, let's keep going and see if we can find more. These dealers come all the way from Roseburg, Oregon and they have a selection of kitchen items, jars, bottles, graniteware, enamelware, old tins. These are the sorts of things that we see a lot of interest in because people use them. People like old kitchenware because a lot of it is still functional. One group I wanted to show you here are these Galaxy Orbit Admiral and Interplanetary Commander. These bottles were juice bottles. They came out in 1958. The company went out of business before they used a lot of them and about 15 years ago there was a big warehouse find in Baltimore and all of these came out of the woodwork. Well now they're all in collection so they're actually pretty collectible now and I think they sell for about 30 or 40 a piece. This dealer is out of uh, Nevada apparently and I have not seen them before. These are a lot of Buddy L and other large uh, metal vehicles from the 1920s. The Marion with the dump truck back end is hard to find. This is a Buddy L. The Buddy L has its original ladder. Those are often missing. And it's got all the extensions. This one has not been repainted. This is the aerial truck. And you can see right in there, Buddy L quality toys. These were made in Moline, Illinois, I believe. Another company was Keystone out of Pennsylvania. They did the wrecker behind you here, and you see the wrecker, and it is towing another vehicle, this truck. Very hard to find the pieces that have lots of little parts like the wreckers and things. And these were big. These were not inexpensive toys when they were new. So you see a bunch here and you think, wow, every kid must have had one of these. And exactly the opposite. Not very many kids had these. And so the fact that these have lasted this long when the supply wasn't that big to begin with is pretty amazing. I like this one. It's the Keystone Paddy Wagon. You can think about the Keystone Cops and there they are with the police patrol. Let's get down where you can see the weave. So there you go. There's your traveling jail. Ah yes, modesty. Something we all could use a bit more of these days, I'm certain. This banner is made of silk. It's going to date from about 19... One of my favorite things about the Puyallup show particularly is that people seem to dress in period... Hello! You look so cute! What What period is that dress? It is the Civil War. It's during that time period. Wanted to show you a little more Bakelite. I showed you Andrea's and her friend Janet Upjohn also does a lot of vintage costume jewelry and she brought a nice selection of Bakelite as well. Look at that funny horse with the big grin. And in the middle there you've got that ring on the clear stand. Carved pieces are more desirable than not carved, generally speaking. And black is a very hard color to find. And then down here you're going to see various pins, the lobster carved piece is an unusual one as well. This is an opportunity to talk about patches. We do see a lot of old patches. Now, typically what we see are these bins. 
So here's a whole bin of military insignia and related things. Some can be valuable. There are some that are old. There are some that have gone out of existence. These particular ones are more common, but they're fun to root through. Now here's an example of a more desirable and scarcer military patch. This one is from the 429th Bomb Group. This logo was only used during the Second World War. These are the ones that are going to be more expensive. Here's one B Division with a strangely stylized sort of Donald Duck you've got from the nuclear submarine USS Dace. Here you've got the Yellow Jackets. This one here is interesting. It's for Aleutian Island Service 1945. These are the types that are going to be more difficult to find and more expensive. It, I think because of the wars, it then became very popular to wear uniforms and uniforms had to have patches. Yeah. So in the 50s, especially in 60s, you see a lot of patches made. Now the back of this one is a good indication. See how it's not shiny? That means it's before about the 1950s. They started to do a plastic backing on them and they're pretty obvious at that point. So these are older ones, which is nice. These are what people collect. The Oldsmobile, of course, anything that's for a vehicle or something that's no longer made is good. National car rental is something that's kind of fun. People will uh, collect these. Sometimes they'll even sew them up and use them on things like uh, oh, Halloween costumes and things. But a lot of times it's people collecting them because they're interested in a particular type of thing. So if you're into motorcycles, like this green Kawasaki is going to be a 1970s color. BSA motorcycles, this is great. And you can see this on a motorcycle jacket. If you're a Norton rider or a Ducati rider, they pretty much have you covered here. And again, you're going to see that the backs on these, these are older pieces. These are not brand new. This is a really cool store display, and I had a chance to get one last year and passed on it, and I wonder if this might be the one, but it's a really nice one. Uh, it's Humphreys, it's from England, and it's all these various uh, uh, treatments for all sorts of things right about the time of pure food and drug loss, and you've got like, uh, you have Qatar, or whooping cough, or this or that or the other, and anything between 25 cents and a dollar will cure you of all these amazing things. Uh, you don't see a lot of these displays because, of course, when the Career Food and Drug Act came, then things got a lot more regulated and a lot of these went by the by. And they're asking 500 for it. I looked up the one that I was interested in buying and I think that the similar one is sold for six, so this is really not a bad price for this at all. So you would pay your quarter or your dollar and then you would open it up and your magic potion would be in one of these drawers. So it's a great old apothecary piece out of a uh, pharmacy or drugstore or general store from about 1900. Another area of collecting is Nazi memorabilia, and it can be controversial. First of all, there's a lot of reproductions. What I'm seeing in here appears to be real because it has the right age and the right patina, and also because I've seen this dealer before and I know who knows the difference. If you see a whole ton of similar pieces in one place, be wary. Here's a cool ashtray from the time. Jam your cigarette uh, bucks on this yeah, they skunk. Ones, and they, were kind of reasonable. they actually the made skunk figures with Hitler's face in the 1940s too. I've had a couple. They sell for about $85 now. Some people really have an issue with these things because they figure, well, it was a very hateful time and terrible things happened, but a lot of the people I know who are Historic preservationists point out that if you want to satisfy a Holocaust denier, get rid of all this stuff and pretend it never happened. This space belongs to my friend Mike, and in addition to being a pattern matcher of Franciscan Oasis and other desirable patterns of the 1950s, he also does Blanco glass, which I personally love. This yellow opaline didn't last in the line very long. He's got a bunch of the different fan bases, but he's just got a whole freeze of beautiful Blanco pieces. A lot of these are 1980s and 90s. Uh, Hank Adams designs and Matthew Carter designs, they were the last two of the main designers to work for Blanco and 
they're becoming pretty collectible, so we're seeing a lot of interest in this era now as well. Oh, how neat. These little shoes have Buster Brown in them. I knew Buster Brown did shoes. Thank you for holding that open. That is really neat. So Stereo Opticon cards are collectible, and one area of collecting that is particularly of interest to some folks is World War I related. Here is the British vessel that sunk the German Bucher. This one is a Zeppelin flying over a German town in the First World War. This one you've got uh, armored troop carriers. Here we have how France aided the war, the Renault tanks going to the front. Of course, if you've ever driven a Renault, well, you might be surprised they made it to the front, but I guess they got there. Here's uh, folks manning a cannon, and then here's a biplane from one of the World War I flying aces. Particular areas of stereo card collecting are more desirable than others, and this is definitely one of those areas. A typical stereo card might only cost three or four dollars. These can be 10, 15, and 20, and some can be more if they show particular battles of which there are not good records. Psychedelic 60s concert posters, very collectible now, and here's one for Big Brother and the Holding Company. This is actually for the Matrix, which was down the street from the Fillmore West. And then here you've got one, Family Dog Presents in Denver, and you've got the Psychedelic Cat. The Family Dog is a name we see on a lot of these posters. They were the promoters and they had a lot of these posters made. They're very collectible now. You see, this dealer happens to have a lot of military pins, wings, other regalia. These old wings, if they're sterling, start at 20 to $25 and up. And then you get into the ones that were for commercial airlines. The one on the lower right, right here, is Braniff. Braniff is particularly collectible. They're kind of like Pan Am. They're one of those classic early airlines that people remember fondly. Here's a bunch of home front pins. These would have been worn by people during the Second World War to remember a father, brother, or boyfriend who was over in the war. My friend B and her husband have this space, and they have a few cute things I wanted to show you. I know a lot of the younger collectors are into these Blendo glass pieces from West Virginia Glass Company from the 60s and 70s. And this is neat because this is the whole salad set the way it came originally. It's got the oil and vinegar cruet, you've got the shaker set, and then you also have the uh, bowl. Up here, we've got some old wall pockets from about 1950. I'm going to set down my purchase there. This one says California on the back and EP. I'm not sure who EP was. Um, they actually were knocking off Treasure Craft who did the bananas first. And then this one is also marked California. This is also a Treasure Craft knockoff. Treasure Craft did all these about 1950 and a lot of other companies quickly followed suit. Again, Pyrex and Corning. We're definitely seeing interest and so you're seeing it coming out at shows. Here's a nice wall shelf for a hundred and a quarter that is going to date to about 1900. It would be really nice for display if you had an entry where you needed a mirror to check yourself out on the way out every day. And then I'd like to come in here and show you some of her glass pieces because she has a very cute collection of the little Fenton Bears. She's got just about every color that they made. These novelties were very popular towards the end of Fenton's production. They were something that was easy for people to take if they were traveling, and they came in all their different colors, and a lot are hand-painted. Up here you see the regular Amber Viking Epic Bird, and then on the left you see an unusual variety. This one is Viking as well, but what's different about it is, look at the wings impressed on the side. They usually were just smooth, so the fact that it has that texturing is what makes it different. This is a cookie jar that is also a knotter. 
or people now call them bobbleheads. Boing, boing, boing. <laughs> I think that's lots of fun. To the left is a Florence figurine. This is actually Rhett Butler, and they did a Scarlett O'Hara as well. These came out in the 40s, shortly after Gone with the Wind came out in theaters. There's a nice Fenton custard glacé pairn. That should actually glow in a black light. And I believe these other custard glass pieces would as well. This one is one that we don't see very often from Fenton. This one advertises Budweiser. Funny how beer collecting encompasses almost everything. I did not realize Fenton made things for Budweiser, but that's the team of Clydesdale horses with the Budweiser wagon behind it. In the middle is a pattern I really like. This is the Fostoria Heirloom, and this is the pink color. It came in bright opalescent pastels and was made from about 1955 to 1965. It was super modernist. It was very different, a huge departure from anything Fostoria had done before. Here's a Fenton piece people don't see so often and might not recognize. This is the Ming pattern. This is an acid etching that they did around 1930 and it gives it this really neat mottled effect. Here's a neat sampler, and I'm showing you, I'll back off and show you the whole thing. This one was done in the 1840s, and we know that because she actually sewed her name in with a little poem, and must this body die, this mortal frame decay, and must these active limbs of mine lie moldering in the clay. Mary Turner's work, 1847. It certainly seems like a rather morose sentiment, but what she's really saying is, make haste while the sun shines. And she did by making this very cute sampler. Samplers have become popular again just recently. After a long time of them not selling, I suddenly sold every one I've had. I wanted to show a few other interesting things in this dealer's space. This is Joe Lewis. He was the boxing champion in the 1930s. He was one of the first black people that was lionized in this way. They made the clock of him. It was a big deal because up until then there really were not very many black representations that were not exaggerated caricature. Down below here we have one of these tin drugstore toys. A lot of these were done as little houses and given out as candy containers as well. And of course most of these got thrown away, rusted away, or stomped on years ago. This is a really neat valentine. It is mechanical, which means it opens up. It's going to be about 1920 printed in Germany, and it is really neat, very detailed. Dealer just told me that this piece is priced at 75, and this guy is fun. This is advertising Pontiac Fine Car. This is going to date to sometime right about 1950. Well, I'm going to stand here in front of the Wheel of Fortune and hope for some good luck as I go make my final rounds. It's been really fun taking you through the Puyallup Antique Show. It was a surprise to me that I was here because I'm usually not this time of year. And next time I'm here, hopefully I'll be selling here and I'll show you how that end of the business goes. But it's been really fun to look around. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for liking and subscribing and all that good stuff. We really appreciate it. It all helps. And we'll see you again next time. I'm George at the Antique Nomad. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at the Antique Nomad. Bye for now!